Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, KBEC's Autism Hour, uh, hosted by KBEC and presented by Ms. Uh, Kimberly Howard. Thank you for being here, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. So I am Kim Howard. I work for Kentucky Autism Training Center. Um, today's topic is just tips for getting started um, and thinking through uh, what are things that we need to do at the beginning of our school year? Uh, it's a really stressful time. <laughs> there are so many pieces that um, we need to think through. There we go. All right. So I think these are funny. Um, uh, I always say, so which one of these? Uh, tell me how you're feeling. This is my own feelings check in. Uh, how are you all feeling today? Uh, you can put it in the chat um, if you like. Um, I will tell you, I'm somewhere between that six with the owl, with his little eyes peeking out, <laughs> um, or maybe the sloth that's just peeking out of the door. Anyways, I think these are pretty funny. Uh, these are fun to do with kids too. Uh, just kind of an icebreaker, but think about how are you all feeling today? <laughs> Where are we at with that? Um, also, there is a sign-in sheet if you like, and the resources, uh, some of us are at an eight. <laughs> the owl is very cute. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're looking at the world sideways thinking, what in the world is happening here? <laughs> um, hopefully your school year is off to a wonderful start. Um, I'm not sure if all of the region is back in, but my guess is that most of the region is back in. Um, a little bit uh, more northern eastern Kentucky, uh, some of their schools aren't aren't back in quite yet, uh, but we're back. We're getting our, our year started. Um, at the start of the school year, I always think it's really important. <laughs> that quote is not from someone famous. That's a typo. That's hilarious. Uh, I always think it's really important to, it, I'm going to be the, the someone famous, pair yourself with reinforcement. Um, make sure that you are the giver of good things. We want kids to associate uh, coming to school with positive, happy things. Um, I saw a, I saw a photo one of my uh, one of my friends posted and said, "Here are my kids rolling to school. They haven't been up before ten o'clock. You know, kids have been out on summer break um, at home." Um, in many circumstances, it's free reign access to things like iPads and snacks and um, lots of happy things are happening. So they've been in a place for months, you know, a couple of months where it's hopefully high rates of reinforcement. They're at home and they're getting access to things that they want and not necessarily having to work for those or to do very many things for them. Um, and then we come to school and all of a sudden they need to get up hours earlier than they have all year <laughs> um, and they've got to adjust to maybe they can't have access to their iPad the whole time. Um, they can't have free reign access to snacks all day long. Um, so adjusting to those circumstances can be a big adjustment for everyone, adults and kids alike. Um, make sure, especially those first few weeks of school and all throughout the year, that you are uh, being the giver of good things. In my classroom, I had multiple adults. Um, so I was the teacher and um, I failed at this uh, because I wanted to make sure that um, I saw myself as the person who went through the academics with my kids or went through the behavior things with my kid, with my students. And when it was time for them to get reinforcement, I sent them off with an, an assistant um, who could you know, do that reinforcement piece with them. And so what ended up happening was happened. when the students saw me, I was the giver of bad things, right? I was the person that they learned to associate with. Anytime they saw my face on their, on their schedule, they knew that what we were going to do might not be something that they enjoyed. We were going to work on math. We were going to work on those IEP goals. We were going to work on reading, social studies, all of those academic skills, which weren't necessarily reinforcing to them. And so I did some reinforcement, but their big rewards, they went off with another adult. So if you are a teacher or if you are any adult working with students of any age, make sure that at least some of the time you're there for the party, right? Be the giver of that, of the good things. When we think about reinforcement and we think about students with autism specifically, uh, 
we have to think about what will they work for. Um, that is a question that I get all the time. What what can my students work for? And we'll think about that in a second. I get asked, uh, what is reinforcement, right? So reinforcement is anything that makes someone's behavior more likely to occur again, right? Um, think about this for a second. Would you, I always ask this to people, would you run one mile for $50? right? Would you run one mile for $50? Uh, for myself, that answer is no. I am not running one mile for $50. I do not enjoy running. Um, that $50 is not enough reinforcement for me to get off my couch. Uh, let's be real here. If I'm running, you all need to run too. Something is about to eat us. Um, so now, but if someone came up to me and said, hey, Kim, would you run one mile for $5,000? Yes, <laughs> for $5,000, I'm going to get off my couch and I'm going to drag my, you know, sad, broken self <laughs> down to the start line and I'm going to try to run that one mile um, to see if I could get that $5,000. The same thing happens for our students. Some days they need the $50 reinforcement, right? They need the smaller amount of reinforcement. Sometimes what we're asking them to do for them is really hard. Um, and we have to think through how how hard is it for that student? And it doesn't matter what if we think it's hard for them or not. It's how they perceive what we're asking them to do. So if they feel like this is very hard for them, then you might need a higher rate of reinforcement to consider um, to consider for them. So remember that not all reinforcement is the same. Sometimes I can get away with a high five and a social praise. Great job. I love how you did that. And sometimes I'm doling out a sticker, extra time on the computer, some other kind of reinforcing activity for my students. And it just um, depends on, it just depends on those kinds of things for them. So um, Sasha Long says, be a chocolate chip cookie. I don't know about you, but I love me a chocolate chip cookie. So that's your reminder, be the giver of good things. Um, how do you find out what a student likes? Well, if I have a student that has um, severe behaviors or I have a student that uh, they require high rates of reinforcement, meaning that I know that they have probably some kind of behavior plan and I'm having to provide them with additional reinforcement way beyond what I do for my typical student, then I am gonna keep a list of things that they like. Uh, and I'm also going to know that they may not like the same thing every day, right? I love myself a good Snickers bar. <laughs> I like a Snickers bar, but sometimes I eat a Butterfinger, right? Um, so in my classroom, I kept a list of things that the kids liked. Um, students, uh, sometimes I could ask the student and I could say, hey, you know, what do you want to work for today? What kinds of things do you want to work for today? And I had some students that could say, I want to work for the iPad. I want to work for, I had a student who worked for time. Um, he liked to work with the janitor. Um, and we had a, an agreement with the custodian that on Fridays that he could earn minutes um, for like up to about 20 or 25 minutes during the last lunch, um, during the last lunch period. He loved um, hanging out and with that janitor and it was agreed upon and his family loved it. Um, and so that was one of his reinforcers. Um, I had a student that one of his reinforcers were tiny pom-pom balls, like the, like the craft balls. And he would work for access to a bucket of those little balls and he would put his hands in them and drop them in front of his face. I've learned that by observation, right? How did I figure out that's what he liked? He wasn't a student that could verbally tell me that. Um, I ask parents, I ask previous teachers. Um, and then if I really don't know, I turn them loose in my classroom and I see what do they go towards? Um, or I bring some different items and I put things out on the table in front of them and just kind of let them play with some things and see what kind of things will they work for um, that will work inside of my classroom. So also know you have to be able to control the delivery of reinforcement. I had a student that um, we worked with for several months and we had not found a very good reinforcer. Um, he would work and we could get some things out of him, but we hadn't found anything that he was like really excited about. And we had tried for months to find the right uh, reinforcer for him. And then we found the good eyes. 
Anybody know what good ice is? So where I'm, so a Sonic in that area had the, you know, the tiny crutched ice, the perfectly lovely, tasty ice. Um, and it just so happened that our school had that kind of an ice machine. Um, and so he stole my cup one day and was eating that ice. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, the good ice. Um, and so it was really great. It worked really well. He would work. We made a card. It said, I good ice on it. Um, he would work for that good ice. And then we shared it with his parent who was perfectly lovely person and was excited that they found, we found something that he liked. So on Monday, when he rolled up to school, came, pulled up to school in his car, he had a whole cup of the good ice. Would he work for me for good ice that day? No, I hadn't controlled the delivery of it, right? I could not control access to good ice um, at that point, at least when he was on home. So later in the day, he was willing to work for a little bit of good ice, uh, but that morning, he had no interest in it at all. So it needs to be something that you can control access to if you're able to do that. Master scheduling. At the start of the school year, one of the most important things that you can do um, is think about your master scheduling, especially if you're an MSD classroom teacher, if you are working with special education students, um, you really need to think through and process out your entire day. I did this in my, um, it wasn't a self-contained MSD classroom. I did have students that went in and out for a large portion of the day, but it was critical for me to know each and every student. And I'm going to give you a couple of places that are free. Um, you can download a copy of these that you can edit and make your own. Um, and there's a few different ways they might look. The example on the on the left side of your screen, um, underneath the master scheduling, it has the student names across the top, right? So those are the student names. And then down the left side of the screen, you can see she's done her entire school day in 15 minute increments. It doesn't mean that she's changing activities every 15 minutes, uh, but it means that students, it gives her a place that she can um, put students in or out as she needs to. The other piece is, is that this is color coded and it shows, uh, so the specific colors are related to specific people. Um, in my classroom, I gave every adult in my classroom a color, <laughs> right? Um, and those colors uh, let them know who was responsible for which group of kids. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. On the right side of your screen, you can see where it says um, the teacher's name and then aid one and A2. So this is an adult schedule and then they have plugged the students in based on the adult. Up to you which version works better um, and it's really going to depend on your preference in your classroom. There are many, many different ways. It could absolutely look like this. Um, this is a high school schedule uh, or it's broken down from, from a high school from a high school schedule. Um, you can see they have class periods, period one, period two, homeroom, all the way through the end of the day. Um, she, so she has the school schedule out there and then she has the 15 minute increments for working inside of her classroom. I love this. This was the way for me, this let me know um, I knew exactly where my kids were. I knew to the minute what I was supposed to be doing every day. As a teacher, when I first created this, I was really intimidated for some of my students because I had students who had extensive support needs that were with me all day. And it let me see that there were holes in their schedule. There were chunks of time that I didn't have them they weren't doing anything, right? I didn't have them doing enough activities. Um, I didn't have them doing enough items uh, in their day. They didn't have enough learning going on. And so it really, for me as the learning professional, it opened my eyes and I'm able to glance at my master schedule and say, Johnny is getting, I'm meeting all of his areas. I've covered reading, I've covered math. I've covered all of these different pieces um, and I've added in time to work on IEPs or different things like that. Um, it really lets me break down minute by minute exactly what I'm doing as the as the teacher leader. It let me break down by minute exactly what my classroom assistants are doing. I don't know about you all, but I had um, the most assistants I ever had was I think five. Um, being responsible for ten students and five adults and myself—that's sixteen people. 
<laughs> that's 16 people to keep track of. Um, that's a lot. Um, so a master schedule really took the pressure off of me. If um, I had a, I had a person out, and if you have six adults, someone is missing every week, probably, especially post-COVID. Um, we're getting a lot more absences. Uh, so if some, if, you know, Sally Mae was absent and I had a sub adult in there, if I got a sub, then I could plug them into that. They just took that person's place and followed their schedule the whole day. Uh, it made my life a lot easier. I didn't need to write them out special, a special schedule. We just plug them in. Um, or, you know, I switched my adults up and maybe they could not be with that person, uh, but they followed a different uh, adult's schedule. So if you're thinking about making your own master schedule, and I really encourage you to do it, the nice thing for me was, was that um, I was able to take my master schedule and show, okay, I can cover all of these areas of my day, but these couple of chunks of the day, I don't have enough adults. I can't, um, I cannot meet I can't meet all of my IEP goals. I can't meet all of my kids' inclusion. Um, I can't meet those things. And here is my schedule laid out. And I was able to take that to my administrator and say, please look at my schedule. Please tell me how I can make this work. Um, and so when they looked at my schedule and it was broken down to the minute and I was able to say for one hour a day, I needed an extra adult to come in to allow, to allow my aides their break. Um, so that people could go in and out of the classroom. Uh, so it helped in that manner as well. Um, so if, if you're going to build this, start with your non-negotiable time slots first. So think about things like your lunch times are set by school, right? So, you know, first grade lunch happens at specific time or 12th grade lunch, maybe that happens at a specific time. What about if you're thinking about recess or afternoon breaks? When I was in high school, we had a 110 break, right? That's a non-negotiable time. And you're going to put that into your calendar. Maybe it's special classes. Um, like if we're talking about younger kids, then we're thinking about their special class rotation. So art, music, maybe, maybe it's PE, maybe it's computer lab whatever your school special classes are, those are on a, on a schedule that you have no control of. So you're plugging those in first. And then you're thinking about, in my student's IEP, it says that Sally May will go to social studies. She's in the fifth grade. She's taking the fifth grade. Um, she's taking the fifth grade alternate assessment. She's going to go to social studies for that 60 minute block. Um, that's non-negotiable. You're not going to have any control over what time social studies is taught. Um, so you'll need your school schedule. So you, first off, you need your school master schedule because that's going to tell you your lunch and your special class times. And then you need your gen ed teacher schedules, right? That is how you get started. Um, and then for your own self, if you are self-contained or you have students that are with you for the majority of the day, you are looking at your schedule and you are thinking about what subjects am I supposed to be teaching? Well, reading, math, social studies, science, so your core classes, especially if you're thinking about alternate assessment, um, maybe you should be thinking about when are you doing one-to-one -one work time? So uh, I called it teacher time, but maybe it's one-to-one -one work time. Maybe it's a small group. Maybe you do a center rotation. When do you have time in your schedule to teach social skills or self-help? Um, when do you do your calendar or a, like a morning meeting or an afternoon meeting? And then at the end, after you have plugged in all of your kid information, then you plug in your adults. Um, one of the things that I did with my schedule was I zoned my classroom. Um, and this resource that you see up on the screen, um, both of these are free, uh, downloadable, editable master schedules. And you can kind of create them, type them in, and make them your own. So those are very nice because we know those first few weeks of school, the schedule sometimes shift and changes. Um, first grade lunch had to be moved back 10 minutes or be moved up 10 minutes because the kindergartners, you know, couldn't get out of there that fast. Thinking through some of those pieces will be critical. Um, but I love this. This was incredibly helpful. And it allowed me to do things like I zone my classroom. 
So I could say, uh, it's me in here and these two adults, and I am responsible from um, 9.15 to 9.45 for these three kids and this center station. Um, Susie is responsible for this station and Johnny is responsible for this station and they're each gonna have these two or three kids. Um, and then we're gonna rotate. Um, it allowed me to do things like that. So I knew in my classroom that if there was an issue with these two or three students, then I didn't have to jump in right away. I could allow that adult, hopefully they've had some training and they have the skills to do it. I could allow that adult to try to manage that circumstance so I don't end up taking academic time away from every kid in that moment. And I can feel a little bit less pressure because I know that Susie is the one that's responsible right now. And Susie knows that she's the one responsible. She knows that it's her job right now to take care of those students. I don't have to worry about her um, not knowing what to do. Uh, we have zoned out the classroom and given everybody specific. Um, everybody has their own schedule right down to the minute. Um, so it made my life so much easier as the special ed teacher, especially in, I wasn't a totally self-contained class, right? My students went in and out, but I did spend a lot of that time in my, in my classroom with um, students with a variety of, of disabilities. So maybe you are a gen ed teacher, right? Um, maybe you're coming at this from gen ed. Um, maybe you're coming at this from a special ed teacher who are who is spending their day in the gen ed classroom, which is great and wonderful. Um, we have to think about the gen ed environment. So when students come into the special ed classroom, I know that all of those kids are going to have a very diverse needs, right? I know coming in and when I plan an activity, I typically am thinking about how am I gonna modify that for all of those students. For gen ed classroom, we have to start doing some of those thinking, right? We have to start shifting our thinking. And we know that even in a gen ed classroom that um, one size rarely fits all. And I think that we're doing a much better job of thinking about um, how do we move towards planning for diverse learners, right? How do we move towards making that gen ed environment a much more friendly place? for students with and without disabilities that have some different needs. So some of the things that you can think about is having a variety of seating options. Um, I have seen a, a really big push for this um, and thinking about how can we accommodate um, students who need the option to wiggle or students who maybe need a quieter area. Um, think about it from the beginning on planning for different learning styles and different classroom needs. How do we start out planning for from the beginning, knowing that I need to offer students options in how they're responding to academic work. I need to offer students um, some choices in how they're gonna respond um, to the learning in our classroom. And that's in a gen ed classroom as well. Um, and if we start from there, we already know that coming in that our students are all gonna have diverse needs. And if we start from there, it's so much easier to accommodate, right? It's so much easier to say this small group of kids needs needs this, this small group of kids needs this. Um, and I know that's a big job, which can be really overwhelming, but we have to think about, um, think about our gen ed classrooms have become much more diverse. We have kids with a variety of disabilities out there in that classroom and we want everyone to access the academic skills. We want everybody to be able to access um, all of the, every bit of the learning that they can get from it. Um, other things to think about are, think about your assistive technology needs. This could be low tech. It could be something as simple as a pencil grip. Um, at the start of the school year, I encourage you, if you're a gen ed teacher, a special ed teacher, whoever you are, um, if you are receiving students with disabilities or students on a 504 plan, um, you need to ask their previous teacher. Hopefully somebody is providing you with some good information and some helpful information about what worked in their previous setting. Um, but at the beginning of the school year, especially, sometimes what I see happening is um, there wasn't a plan for how we're handing off 
um, this student. So they were in the seventh grade last year. Now they're in eighth grade, but none of their materials transferred with them, <laughs> right? Um, their assistive technology needs, um, they had a pencil grip in the seventh grade, but we didn't bring it down to the eighth grade hallway, right? They had a wiggly seat um, in their first grade classroom last year, but it didn't make it to the second grade classroom. Last year, I had a um, child that I worked with that at the previous grade, they had a really robust communication system that worked really well for them. And um, I was so excited because I knew that when they went into the next school year, that this year it was going to start off so much smoother because they would have brought with them the things that worked from the previous year into this next year. And that didn't happen. There wasn't a handoff <laughs> of those materials. And so I know it's a little late for this now. <laughs> um, at the end of the school year, we have to hand off those materials, that communication system, if it's not going home with them, if it's something that is school-based only, um, that schedule, visual schedule, that pencil grip, if you know, whatever the technology is, it needs to be handed off to the next set of teachers. Um, we think about transitioning, you know, we do a big thing for transitioning to kindergarten. We do, we think about transitioning to preschool and, and we think about the big transition, like when we transition to middle school or when we transition to high school, but we fall down sometimes when we transition within the same school building. Um, and, and it doesn't, they don't, they don't get those materials brought to the next place. So think that through. If you don't have the materials, it's not too late to contact those teachers from last year. Find out where that stuff is. You need it. They need it. Um, so plan for that. Um, and now next year, you'll already know. And at the end of this year, have a plan for handing off this material to the next set of people. All right, visual supports. I cannot say enough good things about visual supports. Um, if you have a student with autism in your classroom, you 100% should have visual supports. Uh, it is highly researched. It has been around for not 100 years, but it's been around for a lot of years. Um, visual supports work with um, a strength for our, our autistic students, right? Um, not all of them, but many of them are visual learners. So if I, anything that I have to say over and over, um, anything, if I have a student that's not transitioning uh, from activity to activity, then they should have a visual schedule. If I have a student who I'm having to say, for, say the words over and over, um, on the left side of the screen, you see the one that, the little visual that says quiet, those are called ring prompting cards. They are just visual directions. These are for the adult to show the child to be quiet. I had a student that we worked with last year um, and his ring prompting card had one that said feet on the floor. And it was just a picture of, uh, you know, two feet on the floor. We made it ourselves. It was not as pretty as these, but it worked so well. This was a kid that climbed, <laughs> he climbed on the, the shelves, he climbed into the window frame. And the first time I met him, I came into the building and he was up, uh, you, know, you know, looking out of the window through the window frame. Uh, which was not a safe plan for anyone. Uh, so the first card that we did, the first visual support said feet on the floor. Um, maybe it's a change alert. Uh, students with autism don't do well when there are sudden or unexpected changes. Think about our own self. As a functional adult, they changed Kroger on me, right? <laughs> is any, uh, that is a true adult experience for expect, experiencing unexpected change. When they change your store that you go into all the time and you know right where the bread aisle is for the last 20 years, it's really upsetting. Same thing for our students, only they are younger and they haven't had as much time to practice and to deal with unexpected changes. We know that things will happen within the schedule. So if you're using a visual schedule, this card that says change alert is a great card to use. And I'll upload the change alert card into the Google Drive. I'll make a note of that. Um, I'll upload a couple of options for that into that Google Drive so you have some free access. The ring prompting cards can be found for free on a website called Victories, the letter N, Autism. 
it's a mom in Canada that created that website. There are many, many visual supports on there um, that are free. And there are lots of great options for um, free visual supports that you can find um, out online. Uh, so if you're looking for something, let me know. Maybe you need to think about visual structure. Um, students with autism often need support with visual structure. Um, how do they process the information? How are they going to get through this class period? So the example on the left with the binder with the multicolored folders, um, some of the ways that I have seen these be used, um, obviously it says the to do and the finished. Um, when I use these with my older students that were going from class to class, each folder was represented a single class and we color coded them. I see many um, classes do this now, right? Every, every, every color, every class, you know, you need a blue folder for the science class. You need a green folder for the math class, um, whatever that looks like. Um, same exact thing. We're just thinking about it on a little bit different scale and we're adding that things to do and finished. And we're teaching them that if it's on that side that says to do, then when they get to this class, this is something that needs to be done. Um, or I have seen this be used for, this is the homework. Um, here is something that needs to be done. There's a few ways that you could use this. Um, the example on the left, on the right is structured teaching. And both of these are part of structured teaching. Um, it is simply a workstation. Workstations can be fabulous for your students that don't know how to learn. Uh, this would be a whole training in and of by itself, uh, but workstations are a really good way for our students that do not know how to process out and learn to get a start at that. Um, it's not something that they should do all the day or the only thing that they should do, but it gives you a good way to teach them how to learn and then to use that to access many, many types of learning. Um, so visual structure could be things um, uh, like the tape on the desk or tape on the floor. Um, they're also all parts of visual supports. Um, it could be um, at the beginning of the school year, I see lots of um, taped feet on the floor or lines that mark uh, here's where to stand and here's where to stop. It could be things as simple as the pause button. The pause button has been a really good a really super good addition to visual supports. Many of our students are technology-based. Um, our kids are spending a lot of time on technology and a lot of time um, on YouTube or on video games. And so they understand the concept of pausing that YouTube video to get a snack. Um, so pause button can be used for, I had a kindergarten class that I worked with last year and their center rotation uh, was broken up uh, by their lunch. So they would get started with centers and then in the middle of center rotation, they would stop what they were doing and they would all line up and go to lunch because that was how their lunchtime fell. Uh, and so this particular student did not like to leave things unfinished. It was really upsetting and um, stressful for him to walk away without completing it. Well, if he stayed and completed it, then he was missing his lunchtime. <laughs> Um, which was not good for anyone. So we implemented the pause button. Um, so he would do the center as the students were getting ready to go to lunch. The teacher would place a printed out pause button onto his work and say, hey, we're pausing this right now. We're going to run down and have lunch. And then we come back, we'll unpause it and you can go back to work. And it worked, right? It was pretty fabulous. Um, we went from him melting down and, you know, just crying and being very upset because he needed to finish that work before he could let go enough to go to lunch. Uh, but he, when we paused it, he knew what pause was and it was really familiar with him. We had tried to stop sign. We had tried a few things and those weren't effective, but pause pause was effective. So remember the power of the pause button. My only rule is if I pause something, I must unpause it in the same day. Because if I start pausing things and I don't come back to them, then the students will catch on to that. They will quickly learn that if I'm pausing things that I really mean we're stopping and the card will lose its effectiveness. Um, so just a really nice option. There are hundreds of visual supports out there. So many places that you can go with visual supports, so many things to think about. Um, a part, another good strategy to think about at the start of your school year are your routines. I know I talk about routines all the time. <laughs> I can't say enough about routines. Routines 
Take a second and think about what's your coming home routine every day. What's the things that you do when you get home? So when I go to my house, as soon as I walk in the door, I take my shoes off. I hang my keys up. If I don't hang my keys up next, then they will be lost into the abyss, right? Um, I recently, we have started living with my father-in-law and I'm trying to develop a new routine for myself at his house. Uh, because routines help us to remember what we need to do next. Routines keep us in consistency and routines are calming, right? Routines make us are comforting and make us feel better. Um, routines are common routines in an elementary classroom are things like um, your arrival to school. Um, it might be, how do we line up? How do we get a drink of water? Uh, the routine for walking through the lunch line, right? Um, the routine for morning morning meeting or morning circle time. Maybe it's calendar or sitting or like story time on the carpet. Um, we have to purposely think about how do we teach them. Um, elementary age, we spend 50% of our academic day in everyday routines. So they are critical. And what I see for our autistic students is we have a lot of breakdowns during routines. They struggle to follow the pattern if they don't know what the pattern is. So think about things like there's some good examples of visual supports. Um, there are picture-based one and there's just written ones. If you work with students who are effective and good readers, have a class procedure or class routine written out, right? It could just be in writing. It doesn't have to be a visual if that student is an effective um, and, and able to comprehend that routine. If they're younger or if they are still learning their reading skills, then adding that visual support to it will help them to process out what you're asking them to do and be more effective. Um, other things to think about, routines let us set up as many activities as you can. <laughs> if I know exactly what the flow of my classroom is like, I have planned out my master schedule, I have that laid out, I know at 8.45 I'm doing reading, at 10.10 uh, we're doing morning calendar. I can prep those activities, I can have my materials ready, I know exactly what what I need to do. In my classroom, I kept a set of baskets for the day and I came into school early. <laughs> I came into school about 20 minutes early and that 20 minutes I dedicated to setting up as many activities as I could. I made sure I had my copies, if at all possible, if I didn't get them done the day before or I didn't have you know, one of my assistants make copies for me, uh, then I put them in the basket. Uh, so that way, when it was time to teach whatever it was I was teaching, then I could pull that material out. Um, I didn't want a lot of downtime for my students because if they had a lot of downtime, then they created their own problems <laughs> and their own routines, right? Um, I also planned for wait time or downtime activities. I worked in a classroom with students with significant disabilities, um, extensive support needs, um, there were going to be moments to where we could not start reading at 845 because someone was having a behavior issue that I did have to intervene with. Now, sometimes I was able to tag team with another adult in my classroom and they could come and teach my reading group and I could go and deal with that student who was struggling behaviorally. Sometimes uh, the behavior situation or whatever was happening. I had a student get injured in my classroom. They fell and cut their self um, pretty terribly on a, um, you know, they caught their finger on a, on a filing cabinet and it was a sharp edge and it split their hand open and they're bleeding all over my classroom. When that happened, my classroom had a standard weight activity um, I could tell my students, every kid in my classroom kept a folder. We called it the red folder. <laughs> I told them, I said, get out your red folder. My students could get out their red folder and they knew inside of that folder were things that they could do. Um, it, for some of my kids, it was simple, simply a coloring sheet because that was the only independent thing they could do. For some of my kids, it was a sticker book. It was a magnetic thing. Um, for some of my kids, it was a storybook because they like to read stories. Uh, for some of my older students, it was um, some practice lessons, things that we had already done and they could pull it out and work on that. And the students knew the deal was, was that if they pulled that folder out and they worked on it for a few minutes, long enough to allow us to get through the crisis moment, 
then they would get some sort of positive behavior reward. So they knew that there was a reinforcement coming. It could be, and that looked like a lot of things. Maybe I was going to say, let's take five extra minutes at recess. Maybe I was going to say, um, here's a sticker for everybody today. It varied on what it was. Now, did that work for every student that I had? No, I still had a few students who required a one-to-one -one adult, right? That could not wait independently. Uh, but for the bulk of even my extensive support need classroom, they could do a planned wait time activity. The other thing that I did was I had a specific, um, if I had a student who was waiting to transition out of my classroom, say they're going with a speech therapist and they should be there in two minutes, then I had a chair or a bench um, near my door that had a small basket of activities that they could do. A lot of times it was like a sensory toy. There were some books in there. There were a few items that they could play with um, or entertain their self with while they sat in that chair and waited to leave my classroom. So think about how are your students waiting? What are the routines of your classroom? And how can you set up your activities before? How can I set up my activities ahead of time so I don't have a lot of downtime with students waiting for me to get things set up? And that's hard. <laughs> Those are all hard things. Um, but if you don't plan your routines and you don't know what they are, then your students will plan the routines and they may not be what you want and they may not be functional. So know that. It's really important at the beginning of the year to have a plan for how you will take data. Um, data is definitely required in special education. Um, you need to really think through how are you taking data at the beginning of the school year, you need to review those IEPs. You need to review if you have a student who has a behavior intervention plan, um, you need to pull those out. Even if you're the person who wrote them, I would still suggest take a few minutes, glance through there and make sure that you're not missing things. Set up some sort of data collection, whether that's an electronic system, whether that's on paper. I don't know what's appropriate for you and your setting and your school district. Um, but have a plan. If you don't have a plan for it, it's going to be the end of the first nine weeks and you're going to be going, oh, I didn't take any data. <laughs> oh, it won't be good. Um, as an experienced teacher, I can tell you that's 100% what will happen. Um, so one of the things that I did at the start of every school year, hopefully before, but I could always do it at any point very early in the school year, which we're still very early. I had a calendar that um, listed out all of my students' um, IEP due dates. And it wasn't even a calendar. It was just a sheet, you know, just a Microsoft Word document that said Johnny's due November 2nd, Susie's due on October 3rd. I listed out when are my kids due for their just annual IEP? And is this a three-year reeval year? Because that's really important information to think about at the beginning of the school year. We know those are big. Three-year reevals can be a very large process. And you definitely don't want to wait till the last minute to start planning for those. Um, so review your IEP. Make sure you know what are your students' goals, um, what are their goals and objectives, and how are you taking data for those? Um, review those behavior plans. Make sure that you're implementing those behavior plans and that you're taking good and accurate data on them. Maybe you work um, at an age that you're thinking about transition planning. Um, that could be high school. Maybe it's transitioning from preschool to kindergarten or kindergarten to whatever. Maybe it's a big transition year, you know, middle school to high school. I don't know, but you're thinking about transition planning for that student. And we're thinking about transition planning in August, right? We're thinking about that early. Um, I might not do, need to do anything with it until December, but I have a plan in August about how that's going to happen, or at least um, I've got that date marked and I'm, I'm starting to think through some of those things. It gives me time now to ask a friend for help, <laughs> ask my director of special ed um, and clarify the answers that I need. And it, this will keep me from making it to um, my first nine weeks and realizing that I didn't take any data and I'm now behind the wheel and I don't want to be that way. Um, problem solve at the end of the day with your staff. So if you're the teacher, um, think about problem solving at the end of the day. We have to restructure all the time. What are you doing that works well? What are you doing that doesn't work at all? 
Johnny's desk is too near the door. He's running out and running down the hallway. Well, let's problem solve that. Let's move that desk. <laughs> Where else can we put him in the classroom? Way away from the door. How can we make a more narrow entry point without blocking that door um, to give me a few more seconds to catch up with him? So I problem solved. If it was a really bad day, I problem solved at the end of the day. And I definitely talked through with my staff just a couple of minutes as I was putting my kids on the bus or after they left or at the beginning of the next day, um, at some point, have a conversation with the people that you work with to problem solve. It made a huge difference for me. I didn't see everything um, and no one will see all of it. Um, so I don't have all the information. So if I can talk to the people that are in that room with me, then I can gather more information uh, and take that back. So don't be an island. <laughs> if you are working alone, um, maybe you're the only MSD teacher in your building and probably you are. Maybe you're the only MSD teacher in your district. Find support. Maybe there's another teacher at another building. Maybe when I taught elementary age MSD, I was the only person in the district. I talked with the speech therapist and the OT. Um, I talked with the high school MSD teacher. Those were my sounding boards. Um, as teachers of students with significant disabilities, especially sometimes you can be an island. Even our gen ed classroom teachers, um, our, our LBD classroom teachers, have a buddy, <laughs> have, a, have a buddy. Um, I'm not saying break confidentiality or anything like that, but sometimes you need a safe sounding board for ideas and for thinking through problem solving for your students. Um, we develop autism problem solving teams uh, within school districts. I think that is something that can be really effective. Uh, it takes many heads sometimes to come up with a good plan. Um, so do not be an island. And this is my email and you are welcome to email me. Thank you, Ms. Kim, uh, for your presentation. Thanks folks for being here with us this afternoon and uh, we'll holler at you later. Be safe, be kind, be exceptional.